With drugs in hand, Arkansas gets closer to resuming executions while ruling out drugs of another kind. And the governor sees business opportunities in Europe and a political play in Cleveland. Arkansas Week is next. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. This is Arkansas Week. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Arkansas Week. I'm Lance Turner of Arkansas Business. Well, the state has been moving toward a return to capital punishment since last year, and this week it moved a step closer. But a significant hurdle remains, and that is where we begin tonight. Joining us from the University of Central Arkansas's Political Science Department, Heather Yates. From the pages of the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette, independent journalist Hoyt Purvis, and from the Little Rock NPR affiliate KUAR FM 89, reporter Jacob Kaufman. Thank you all for coming in this evening, or this, this well, this morning, but it airs this <laughs> evening. Uh, amid court challenges, policy tweaks, and drug shortages, Arkansas hasn't executed anyone since 2005. But Jacob, this week the state obtained some key drugs for that process. And after some final legal action, it aims to have some new dates before uh, the beginning of the year. What happened this week in terms of executions? Well, the Department of Corrections informed the governor and the rest of the state that they had secured a supply of a drug that had been expired for, quite, for a while at least. Um, this all dates back to a state Supreme Court decision. There is a state law passed that allows the state of Arkansas to keep the suppliers of these drugs uh, secret from the public. Asa Hutchinson credited that, that state law with allowing a supplier to step forward to provide the state with this paralytic drug that they need. There's three different drugs used in lethal injections. This is one of the three. So we're still waiting for the state Supreme Court's ruling to go into effect, but before that will happen, they're going to decide whether or not to uh, have a rehearing on a petition to, to rehear that case from eight death row inmates. And so once that is, if that is dismissed, that rehearing petition, then the state can move forward. However, another one of the state's three lethal injection drugs will expire in January. So the governor says, uh, you know, they can get this going. He hopes to get dates set before January. There's, I think, uh, 32 people on death row. 34. 34. I think, yeah. So he doesn't know how many or before January or anything like that. But I'm sure when January comes, he's going to hope that they can find a new supplier like they did for this drug, for that drug that will expire. That has been the trick, Hoyt, is these suppliers, many of them want to get out of the business of supplying right. drugs for this very purpose. Yeah, I'm not at all convinced that despite the intentions of the, the governor uh, that, that this is going to happen uh, because this has been such a convoluted process. And it's really, it's really a sad chapter in the sense that, you know, you have these people on death row, you have the families of the, of the victims, and the process just seems to go on and on and on. And, and the reality is it's been since 2005 since anybody's been executed in Arkansas, and I'm not convinced that it's going to happen uh, in 2016. We've seen some recent debates across the country, Heather, some, some, some executions that have not gone according to plan, and that has made this an even more complicated matter. Sure, especially when um, there are groups mobilized around the Eighth Amendment, and this scene, and, and when you have a botched execution, this emboldens the interest groups that are mobilizing to um, redefine or to um, strip away the notions of capital punishment and how that is um, implemented at the state level. So so with this new occurrence in Arkansas, um, it'll be interesting to see what groups mobilize around any type of decision that comes from the court because we could actually see more mobilization from organized interest groups that were very active in the states where it did not go so well and it actually emboldened that platform to revisit what, how, how does the Supreme Court interpret the Eighth Amendment, then how is the state Supreme Court um, going to take a cue from the federal Supreme Court on that, or is it going to be left to the states to interpret that? So, so here we are within that realm of the state of Arkansas um, interpreting how it's going to um, implement the Eighth Amendment in view of what's happened over the last, last few years. And, and, and on another note, 
is the state of Arkansas going to address that this is the most humane possible way and that they have taken, and being the, the, the state and the Supreme Court, have taken um, all reasonable measures to ensure that it's humane? There, there have been legislators who say we should explore other options for how we Right, kind Perform of swinging the other way, mm -hmm. perhaps the bringing back the electric chair has even been joked about kind of in legislative committees from uh, the governor's nephew, Jeremy Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course the other matter is we've had a Supreme Court justice here recently, last year's uh, Stephen Breyer, who even in an opinion sort of pretty much almost outright said that executions are not constitutional even. Right, right. And that's a long-standing argument that, mm -hmm. that executions and capital punishment is is not constitutional and it, it, it meets the definition of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so that has been a long-standing argument, um, roughly, you know, 100 plus years old. And so um, in the state of Arkansas, the politics around the, the Eighth Amendment um, could be another divisive issue, especially if you have two camps that are calling um, uh, even lethal injection cruel and unusual punishment. And then we also have other lawmakers pushing for, um, you know, more historical means of the electric chair, more hardline means of that. That could actually become a very divisive issue in in November. Yeah. Moving on to other matters of state, uh, Arkansas stands to have perhaps two medical marijuana uh, issues on the ballot this November. One is already certified, uh, but some discussion this week by one of the proponents of one of those measures left the health department having to clear the air, so to speak. Um, was waiting to make that joke all week long <laughs> um, about its stance on the drug. Uh, what happened in terms of the health department coming out uh, with an, a, a very emphatic opinion on medical marijuana? Wasn't so surprising the health department jumped in so early. Uh, Governor Hutchinson was asked earlier this week once one of these measures um, made it onto the ba November ballot, they turned enough signatures to, for the, to the Secretary of State to get on the ballot. He was asked and he said, well, of course I oppose this. He used to head the Drug Enforcement Administration, responsible in some way for, probably for jailing tens of thousands of people some of them for medical marijuana use at least. But uh, you know, he said that he wasn't going to take the lead on this. He wanted the medical community to speak up. This is a medical issue. He didn't want it to be a, pol a political issue since it is about medical marijuana, this particular ballot item. State Surgeon General uh, uh, Drew Ble or Greg Bledsoe, rather, he, uh, he came out saying that there was, he wanted the FDA to look at it. He said that we shouldn't rely on anecdotal stories, albeit from about a majority of states at this point. So the Department of Health came out shortly afterwards saying that you know, this needs to be approved by the FDA, which is a little strange coming from conservatives and conservative appointees to state government to kind of almost be aching for a federal regu regulatory structure. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's kind of the main line, I think. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it's an, it is an interesting argument. And it, one, one, I think part of the implication of this was that one of the proponents had talked about how the health department was going to have to prepare in some way for the eventuality you know, if this passes, there's going to have to be a system set up to regulate and monitor how it works. And other states have had to do that. They've had to uh, get places, get get uh, systems in place to allow mar medical marijuana to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And other um, systems in place, such a financial infrastructure, as Colorado found out after the fact when it passed the most broad um, referendum on the use and consumption of, of marijuana. And um, with, with the state, the Arkansas Health Department, whether they want it to be political or not, it's mm -hmm. already political. Right, yeah. and, and so taking this, this um, very um, safe position almost of wanting then to deflect it and kick mm -hmm. it over to the FDA um, to make it a public safety issue. I understand their angle in doing that, um, but with it being a ballot initiative right there, it's already politicized. So that is going to apply some political pressure to the agency to think forward after November 8 and think about what the infrastructure in Arkansas may look like because uh, to not do that, to mm -hmm. not be preemptive, um, you're going to run into a really a bureaucratic chaos after November if yeah. you don't have the dispensary infrastructure and you don't have the financial infrastructure. And w w ironically, um, coming from the state trying to kick it over to the federal agency, where the federal government's position in 2009 mm -hmm. was came out openly and so basically said that um, you know Eric Holden at that, Holder at that point in time said there is going to be no federal prosecution of mm -hmm. possession of marijuana. So that really places the burden on the Arkansas Health Department again to 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 convince the voters it is not a political issue and to convince the voters that it needs to be a federal agency and not a state agency to well, get And there very on. well may be two different ballot items mm -hmm. for right. medical marijuana. So the State Department's or Department of Health is going to have to have some more sophisticated answers about 
the differences in these two ballot measures in terms of how the state would administer and regulate this. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking to another part of health care in the state, a legislative panel this week finally approved new rules about counselors who might have religious objections to treating certain patients. And some of this was prompted by a similar rule that happened in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Now there's one here in effect in Arkansas, and critics say, Jacob, to get ready for the lawsuits. Right, and this was initially kind of first had its first steps right after, I think the week after the Orlando shooting that targeted an LGBT nightclub. Here's the state legislature in Arkansas passing a bill that groups like the ACLU and Human Rights Campaign say is intended to discriminate, discriminate against that community and limit access to mental health services. So this is an argument we've seen with a lot of different things, with county clerks to some degree, with pharmacists to some degree, is at what point are mental health professionals, any health professional obligated to serve people that seek treatment from them. And this is an exemption carved out, uh, but not directly by the legislature supposedly, but through the, uh, the licensing board mm -hmm. that regulates therapists in Arkansas saying that if you had some sort of religious objection or moral objection to someone's lifestyle like that based on a religious reason, you could then seek to refer them to somewhere else as long as you, sh as long as you show due diligence in further educating yourself about the issue, then it'd be allowed. Fairly thorny issue on, on a lot of different fronts, isn't it, Hoyt? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I, again, <laughs> I think we can depend on seeing the the courts involved in, in any issue like this. It's inevitable, I think. And uh, it's not just like activist groups like the ACLU either. The American Counselors Association has said mm -hmm. this is discriminatory. So that's a difference between a national therapist group and Arkansas. Mm -hmm. okay. right. Heather, we see this other states, obviously we, we cited Tennessee, but. Absolutely, you know, and this is also a great example of policy diffusion of how a neighboring state has passed this law and it, then it emboldened the, the Arkansas state legislature to um, also interpret the lay of the land is that there's enough political capital to get this bill passed and that was proven true on Tuesday and po the political implications here is is um, for November for the short term this may actually embolden um, the Republican incumbents and Republican challengers facing Democratic incumbents on the um, notion of principled politics and the religious freedom um, opt-out exemption and after November, though, what we are going to see the, the political implications is that now there is a burden placed on practitioners who are taking an oath to pra for practice, for, and, and the um, American Counseling Association actually said that, that mm -hmm. this stands against what the oath is. So, so there's another um, dimension here um, that is going to be politicized, you know, and, and it's going to come down to Relig religious liberties and then the, you know, do no harm as a medical care practitioner. So this is also going to be politicized. Will it have a role in November? Um, I, I anticipate it will, but it won't, I think, really gain traction in terms of the lawsuits and the legal interpretation of what religious freedom means and what mm -hmm. that means in the medical profession until maybe after November. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking abroad now, uh, talking about uh, business and government, Governor Asa Hutchinson and Arkansas Economic Development Commission Executive Director Mike Preston, home from a European vacation. Not a vacation, <laughs> though. A lot of work being done. Be but, careful. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, they, will, they will not term it as a vacation, and I don't believe it was a vacation. Uh, all indications are that they were very busy and in, in, in doing, uh, doing the work they needed to do to shore up some existing business relations in Europe and also establish a new office in Berlin. Uh, Jacob, what was the uh, what was the report from the phone call uh, earlier this week from the governor from Germany? Well, no business leads exactly. Well, lots of leads. He lots, says there's about a dozen right. or so leads, but no commitments in hand. He has no uh, direct investments. He can say I've secured mm -hmm. these business investments during my trip. However, I don't think anyone really expected that. And he says that this trip will show dividends down the line. He's absolutely certain of it. But this has kind of been a, one of the hallmarks of the Hutchinson administration traveling abroad, traveling just to other cities in the United States, saying that. I need to personally be out there selling Arkansas as a brand, letting people know, frankly, that we exist compared to other states. Uh, this is the third international office that Arkansas has for these types of economic development reasons. The other two are in Asia. This is the first one in Europe. But the state already has staff to, trying to develop these leads in the past. Uh, the governor's argument for why Berlin, that's where they're setting up the office, is one, it's the heart of the European Union, the most economically viable country, but also it is Europe's largest investor into Arkansas, Germany is. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the governor's report, report, at least on this. He also hired a new person to staff this, who's a German national, 
He claims he, he hired him, his name is Schn Mr. Schnitzler, we'll call right. Mr. Schnitzler, mm -hmm. uh, because he knows the European business community already, but he does need to familiarize himself somewhat, at least according to Mike Preston, with Arkansas's businesses. Right, right. Um, you know, doing business all over the world is, is increasingly right. important. And this we're a global is, economy. Hoyt. Yeah, this is, uh, state governments are doing this more and more. Governor Hutchinson is, is certainly uh, in line with many uh, of his uh, peers around the country. Uh, Germany, Berlin is a kind of an interesting uh, choice because on the one hand, it's not a state, uh, it's not a country with which the U.S. has had a lot of economic interchange. Or, uh, there was a, a famous case back in the 1960s, the chicken war involving Arkansas and Germany, but um, we have, at one time there was an office in Brussels, the, the center of the European Union, but as Jacob indicated, uh, Germany is is the powerhouse in in the European economy, and I think th it's the investment um, bit that might be most important here, rather than direct trade. Not that that couldn't come into play, but that seems to me to be the most likely outcome if there if there is any real serious results from this. He did get to talk a little bit about Brexit, which is our favorite word of the, of the year, <laughs> I think, uh, and actually. In, in, his, in the governor's way of thinking is Brexit may be, present an advantage to Arkansas in terms of its negotiations with some of those folks. Right. Tr traditionally, you hear the narrative, this is bad for the world's economony a little bit, certainly right. for, for the European economy. But the governor's silver lining is if Europe or the European trade union, uh, the European Union is in a weaker position trade-wise, then states like Arkansas have a little bit more leverage, have a little bit more opportunity if they're seeking out these kind of deals. So, you know, it's hard to say what, how, tr how true that is. <laughs> Right, right. That's his belief about it. Right. Well, moving on to, uh, to, the, to the big event of, of next week, and that will be the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. And come to find out, we've got several Arkansans who are taking a prominent role in, in next week, Heather. We do, yeah. So um, the lineup, as we know it this, this morning, as this um, is taping, is Monday and Tuesday. We have two prominent Arkansans speaking. So Monday, Tom Cotton. Um, the theme of Monday's um, uh, convention meeting is uh, national security. Benghazi is going to be a fixture of that for strategic purposes with the, the front runner being Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side. So Tom Cotton with his military background is going to be a featured speaker um, that evening and we'll have a primetime slot last time I, I checked. Tuesday, the theme of the convention is economics. So uh, Governor Asa Hutchison has about a five minute speaking slot um, discussing it, all of the themes that we've just discussed mm -hmm. now will be, I imagine, represented in, in, in the governor's um, speaking time on Tuesday. And then we have Huckabee and other Arkansans that are slated to speak at this point in time, when they're slated to speak um, has, hasn't really surfaced, but we, we have as a state um, representation on that platform and on that stage. So that is going to be um, a good moment for Arkansas. And as I have seen many um, tweets o over Twitterverse that Trump likes Arkansas has been the theme okay. this, this week heading into to Cleveland. Um, so that's the representation we have yeah, to Attorney look forward General to. Attorney General Rutledge will be, uh, she's been involved right. with, the, with the preliminaries uh, and will we'll have some role, uh, right, visible right. role in mm -hmm. Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Well, Arkansas likes Trump, of course, as well. We voted for him <laughs> in the primary. Uh, Jacob, the governor uh, probably has a decent story to tell in terms of, of of the state of things in Arkansas two years into the into his term. Right. And on, on his uh, teleconference call from Europe, he also mentioned that that would be the subject mostly of his speech, in addition to setting the stage for Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee and defeat Hillary Clinton, was to sell the successes of Arkansas, as he mm -hmm. put it. And uh, Arkansas has got a very low unemployment rate, lower than the national average. He can claim some big companies that have come in. So, uh, you know, he, he certainly is going to be able to, I think in four minutes especially, <laughs> be able right. to paint a good pretty good picture for mm -hmm. Arkansas. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, um, people have the right to change their minds and amend their statements, but this is a governor who, in the not-too-distant past, has talked about Trump and his rhetoric as, quote, frightening and not serious. Uh, and during the primary, when he was supporting Marco Rubio, uh, asked Arkansas to, quote, help stop the Trump show. So mm -hmm. it's always interesting when we're trying to unify the party, Heather. Sure, absolutely. And and, and to, to remind the viewers watching this is the purpose of a party convention, it's the kickoff of the general election campaign, the general election season, and it also the dual function is to unify the party. So when... Um, 
Arkansas and the governor was was trying to throw some support to Rubio and it didn't go that way. Now this time period between the primaries and July is um, the reconciliatory period and behind the scenes there's been a lot of not peace brokering this time around, truce brokering. Mm -hmm. And um, the the governor, too, is very strategic in knowing what this could, could mean for Arkansas and how the presence of Arkansas delegation and speakers will also help the party within his state. So it's also um, strategic on that dual role as well. Um, as far as the party overall, the RNC and Rince Priebus, the chair, has had their work cut out for them to try to broker a lot of truce. There's not a lot of peace. There's a lot of boycotting of the party rank and file. So there's, there's multifaceted functions heading into Cleveland as, next week. And the overarching question is, will the RNC achieve the goal of presenting a unified, enthusiastic party to the rest of the nation. Of course, the governor wants to use that platform to um, and, you know, excite and mobilize the Republican Party and also give a bounce of support to the state races and the congressional races. So multi-functions happening all at right. once. Well, well, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Hutchinson earlier supported Rubio. It's important to, or it's interesting to note that a certain governor of Indiana uh, supported <laughs> Cruz at an That's earlier right. stage. So, uh, and and as Heather indicated, the the real question is to what degree the Republicans are going to be able to come together in Cleveland. And there's so so many different uh, elements to that, uh, but that clearly that's what people will be watching, I think, most closely. Well, what we do know is that never Trump never happened. It didn't, it, right. the, the whatever plans there were to, to, uh, to thwart that, uh, that candidacy just didn't come together. Right, that's exactly right, because yesterday the, the rules committee, the delegates um, that were pretty much ha hashing out and pounding out the rules of how the nomination process will be performed next Thursday, the Stop Trump did not gain any traction and they were effectively blocked. So that gives the RNC chair some breathing room um, and maybe maybe with bated breath to relax a little bit that Thursday night there will not be a challenge from the floor because that rule has been effectively eliminated and so there's going to be no infrastructure in place that could challenge the Trump nomination. In terms of the party platform there was some work done on that as well. Yeah. Leslie Rutledge was part of that right. committee to right. to uh, to work on the, the official GOP platform. How does that reverberate now through other races, races in Arkansas, in terms of what the GOP stands for. So what's happening with the platforms in both parties is that we are, we are seeing a lot of concessions being made on the issue platform here. And with the GOP platform, there is um, a little bit of a splintering happening between moderate Republicans and conservative Republicans. And so it's been dubbed the Ted, Ted Cruz effect. So the party conservatives won some concessions with the traditional family value um, platform issues, one being um, the the moderates were not successful in getting um, anti-gay discrimination condemnation language in that platform. Um, on the flip side, um, national security platform issues um, made moderates relatively happy. Mm -hmm. How that plays out in Arkansas is I, I think it will help um, bolster the Republican Party in the state because I, as far as I can and seen from where I'm sitting, it doesn't appear that the Arkansas Republican Party is suffering the same internal splintering as the National Party is. Right. So the traditional family values conservative platform will play very well with state legislative races and congressional legislative races, especially with what we've seen this week come out of the House. So that will play very well with the state, um, but on the national um, stage, this is, I think, where some of those concessions were brought to the table, and this may be the one element that's that's fostering enough cohesion to make it through next week without a party implosion being very, very visible. Yeah, what Heather said is correct, but uh, the reality is that uh, traditionally platforms mean something to party activists, but they really don't get that much notice with mm -hmm. the with the general public, and right. I, I suspect that that will be the case again this year. Right. One thing getting noticed, uh, though, uh, Mike, or <laughs> Donald Trump's uh, final choice on a, a vice presidential candidate announced right. via Twitter this morning. Unless he We're decides to de-Twitter, I, I <laughs> right, think right. we can now safely say that uh, Governor <laughs> Pence is going to be his running mate. Of Indiana. Um, uh, Governor Pence of Indiana, who is a sort of a very Midwestern, uh, he's low-key, certainly 
compared to Trump himself. I don't think he's going to overshadow Trump at any point or compared to Christie or Gingrich, who right. appeared to be the other uh, finalists, if you will. Both of them uh, certainly would have brought a lot of baggage. Um, and it's it's also uh, interesting to point out that uh, Pence has not always agreed with with Trump on everything for on the the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, for example. But the ban on Muslims uh, as well, right? And on on that issue, those are certainly important ones. But uh, he does, to some extent, represent the the party establishment. He's got experience in Washington. He's been an executive uh, as a governor of a state. Uh, so he he brings to the table some of the things that the the more sort of traditional Republican establishment thinks are important. Briefly, Heather, this is always a, a, an important part of a presidential campaign to choose someone. There's been a lot of extenuating circumstances mm -hmm. around this pick. You had the mm -hmm. terrorist attacks in France. Trump mm -hmm. wanted to uh, postpone that, uh, but then he announces on Twitter this morning, has he has he done a good job of doing what he needed to do in making that pick? In terms and, of how he did it. right so so traditionally when um, a front runner is making a VP pick um, there are a couple of things to consider um, is there a geographic region that needs to be considered is there an ideological um, perspective to consider here with with Pence Pence was um, the reasonable pick for Trump because the other two candidates on his shortlist, Christie and Gingrich, came with liability, came with their own political baggage. So Pence provides, he's against the grain just enough because of his record in Congress that he stood out from his party. He was an outlier just enough, but there's a stability component there on policy issues that will count, that, that will lend that balance to the Trump ticket. And that's exactly what the, the Trump Team, I think that's why they picked Pence because he was he was the most um, mainstream, if you will, that will appeal to conservative base and get moderates appeal as well. All right, and with that, we will leave it there. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.